Hi everyone, it's Professor Lusheen. This is Lecture 18, Machine Safeguarding. So again, I'm borrowing a base slide deck or PowerPoint presentation from an OSHA training institute, but I added some things, I updated some things, and I took out some things. Uh, so it's only 50 slides versus the original like 100. Uh, so let's get going. And as you can see, I, I changed things around here. So I've got a dry erase board now that I'm going to try to incorporate out. And the lighting should be better too because I'm not in the corner. I'm out where all the windows are. So hopefully this works. So first thing I want to talk about. So machine safeguarding. The big thing is people are getting hands, arms, bodies, heads. What I mean by head is their hair can get pulled in to machines because they're not properly guarded. Uh, they're not designed so that the people can't, so the, the energy the machine has isn't transferred into the operator versus just into the you know, materials that it's supposed to be working on. So crushed, struck, struck by, things like that. These are the fatality counts from 2014 to 2018. This was from lecture two. So as you can see, number three is contact with objects and equipment. So it's, and, and, and actually it looks like violence has gotten above it. Um, so it looks like it's going to be fourth, if I'm looking at this right, or really close to the uh, slip, trips, and falls. Other noteworthy is it is 2018 is the highest level as far as a count, which to me is a little bit uh, disturbing simply because OSHA has had a, an emphasis program on machine guarding for quite a while now. And so you would think that it would be exhibiting uh, a drop. Here's the non-fatals. Contact with object is third. As you can see, it went up a little, came down a little. Um, again, you would want it to have more of a regular decline as you see with overexertion and bodily reaction because there is an emphasis, they're looking for it. As far as the most costly, things that are struck by or caught in, first one is number eight. Uh, that's the caught in or compressed by, struck by is number 10. So it's not really high on the expensive for injury wise as compared to overexertion falls Oh, struck by object is number three. So we have a three, we've got an eight, and we've got a 10. Okay, so it, it, it is well represented on here then. Excuse me. As far as breakdown by industry, you see the struck by object and, and equipment is in sort of a, a lightish blue. So for all industries, it's third. Second in construction, it's fifth in professional services. Manufacturing, it's third, just right behind overexertion and falls. Uh, we see it third in retail, we see it second in wholesale, we see it third in leisure and hospitality. Here's subpart O. So this is if you go to the standards, these are all the standards applicable to machine guarding. And it is on the list of the top 10 most frequently cited standards, specifically 1910-112. And for the most previous fiscal year, uh, the average citation penalty amount was a little over 6700 but again this manufacturing NAICS 31 it was high for lockout takeout as well for good for guarding the average is 9330 so that's high especially compared to the average I don't know what's going on with that particular sector so what parts of the machine are the most concerned point of operation is what we always use POO uh, that's where the work is being performed. So cutting, shearing, stamping, whatever it is, it's whatever the machine is doing. We could talk about wood cutting as well, the, the blades, uh, the, the, the rotating sanders, rota all this stuff that's, plus, that's part of the machine and being it mechanized, it can do the work if the human body gets anywhere near it and it transfers that energy into the body. Um, that's where a serious damage can be done. Um, just like uh, in the example that I gave you uh, during the this last week's WebEx discussion about the person who got their arm caught in a machine, um, you don't want to think of it of the person doing it on purpose, but rather what led to it. Um, and so things like barrier analysis are, are a good approach to figure out what you need to do to guard a machine. So yes, the work can still be done, but then it really prevents the worker from ever not only needing to, ever wanting to, but incidentally putting their hand where it shouldn't, or foot, or body, or head. It's, it's all those things. And then there's other things like power transmission devices. So these things aren't the things that are actually doing the work to the material, but rather are part a major part of the machine and the energy the machine uses. The operational controls, these are the control mechanisms. Uh, sometimes they're built to keep hands away or bodies away, um, but sometimes workers can actually um, uh, <laughs> uh, 
I was going to say jimmy them <laughs> or, or somehow create it so that they don't have to use them like they're supposed to. Uh, sometimes the controls where they're located may actually cause harm or maybe like an emergency stop isn't in the right position. And then other moving parts can also be a problem such as um, uh, conveyor belts, things that are moving, anything that's moving. Even slow moving, moving shafts, I mean if the person gets caught and they can get pinned into something, even though it's like going slow, it's like they, they're caught and they panic and they don't know what to do and so really in short order um, it can either crush them or choke them. It's things to include for guarding, nip points, rotating, flying chip sparks, belts, gears, all these sorts of things. So I read not too long ago that there was a fatality. Uh, that or I brought it up during one of our discussions of like a fatality report may have happened this semester in which a person had long hair and they got it too close to a rotating shaft and it, it pulled them in. Sometimes it just scalps them, but this one it actually um, caused a severe head injury. Also, when you see this this part here, that's if it's rotating, it's got something um, uh, extruding out, such as nuts and bolts. Sometimes we call those knuckle, knuckle busters because if you get your hand near it and it just taps your finger, it'll bust your knuckle right off. I'm not making this stuff. This is what I was taught. Here they've got two rotating parts in running, and then they got rotating tangential parts, and then they got a sort of card cutting and shearing. You know, over on the right we've got a grinding wheel. We'll talk about that later. Here's where something's moving and it can crush someone against a wall. Uh, that's actually one of the examples from um, one of my consulting in which they had a very slow rotating machine, but it, but people could freely walk behind it. And if somebody was behind it when it started going, this is what it'd do to them. Yeah, this pretty much is, is self-explanatory. If somebody was to get their hands or fingers or anything near the belt, it would suck it right in. Here's a boring, so this is spinning. You get something caught like on it, hair, sleeves, jewelry, things like that. Stamping can crush, amputate. Shears, amputate. A bending will be crushing. So here are some basic guarding principles provided by um, this the OSHA Institute. One is to prevent contact, that's the best. Uh, a secure guard is something that is attached. It's a fixed guard, but you need a tool to remove it. Uh, if you put up some sort of shield so that uh, objects can't fly out, that's another good thing. Uh, you don't want the guard itself to be sharp edged or in other way create a hazard on its own. You don't want it to interfere with the job because then they're gonna try to remove it. Um, and then allow for proper preventative maintenance is what that should say. Location and distance is pretty dictated on how big the gap or opening needs to be in order to feed in uh, material or to access it. Distance is another thing. So if I need a very big gap where I could fit almost my whole arm in, it would, this distance would have to be longer than my arm. Whereas if, it, if, the guard, if the guard needs to be even closer to the point of operation, it would need to be so small that my finger can't get to it. Fixed is, I just described, need a tool to remove. Interlocked means that when everything's closed, it runs, but as soon as that gate is broken, the circuit is broken and it won't run. It's like an emergency stop. Adjustable means that you probably have different size materials that need to be put into the machine, so therefore you can unscrew it and adjust it for that specific need. Basically, you're guarding all unused spaces it's another way to look at it. And then self-adjusting. So whatever you need, it adjusts by itself. You've probably seen that on a lot, either a circular saw or a radial arm. No, not, yeah, radial arm saw has them. Chop saws have them in which the guard's there. And then as you bring it down, the counterbalance removes the guard as you do the cut. Things like that. Table saws have them too. Uh, there's presence sensing devices. And I'm going to be referring to a lot of work provided by Rockford Systems. They're excellent at device guarding. Present sensing, pullback, eh, we don't really don't use pullback anymore other than maybe a sweeper. Uh, restraints, don't really use those as much. Uh, two hand controls are a big one, foot actuators are a big one, gates are a big one. So you, you, you suppress a device, whether it's a foot or a hand, a gate comes down, then it cycles, then it opens. So it just takes more uh, electronics. Uh, <laughs> What's the reason people put their hands into machines? It's because the feeder or the ejector is malfunctioning. 
and they want to keep production going so they put their hand into harm's way to adjust material being fed into a machine or to grab things out that have already been either stamped or cut or bent or whatever it needs robots are becoming much more popular um, there's actually an ANSI standard that the the robots now have such acute presence sensing that you don't need guarding. No, it's very it's a very specific type of servo uh, that controls that to sense it, so that you know you don't have to guard it. It's pretty. It, I, I don't want to talk about it because it is so new. But if it's if you go work somewhere and they bring it up, just Google it. And you'll find some information. But again, it's so new and nobody really wants to talk about it. Uh, but robots typically need to be caged. Uh, because they do the work that you design them to do and they're not typically designed to sense when people uh, enter a space. Also, some people think when things are spinning around or moving around, you may need to add an air brake uh, in order to slow it down because if something's spinning around and then they break the power and it still has momentum, they could still get swiped. And then they've got these other things on here as well you've already read. So this looks like a mechanical power press. That's where I've seen this big flywheel before. This is a permanent guard and they typically have permanent guards for that type of equipment. This looks like some sort of drum roller. There's an interlocking guard. So once you close the cage, it can now, oh, it is a revolving drum. Yeah, usually they'll use that for like either uh, polishing or combining things. Here's an adjustable barrier guard. So this is a um, bandsaw. And so you, you adjust it so that the unused portion is, is covered. Here's a self-adjusting. This is a table saw. And you can see it also has the um, kickback guard too. That's the, the, uh, the black piece that has the teeth on it. So once the bore gets in there, it grabs onto it. So if there was to hit a knot, it wouldn't kick it back. It'd grab onto it. So this is a drawback device. You typically do not see these anymore. People hated them. You don't really see restraint devices as well. Um, they'd rather use present sensing devices. You just, maybe in older places, yeah, but it's, it's, it's restrictive. Here's a tripwire. So um, this looks like a bending machine. So you put the metal feed in and then it bends it, rotates it. So you could take a straight sheet of metal and turn it into like a, uh, a metal drum. Uh, so. This is sort of a, an operator can grab onto it and it's a kill switch. Here's two-handed actuator. The idea is if the operator is using both hands to run the machine, then there's no hands to put into the machine. But sometimes they will you know, tie something around one of them. And so now they're, they're smart. They've got uh, electronics that sense that it has to be depressed and released before it can be depressed again. Kind of, then it therefore it defeats their, um, their, what they've done. Movable gates, that's a great thing too. Uh, I know that uh, you see a lot of this stuff on um, Rockford Systems website as well. So uh, I talked about the location, depending on the opening. OSHA does have an equation as far as how fast a hand can move. And it's really fast. I know a bunch of us used to get together and see if we could go that fast, and we never were. <laughs> But there's a minimum safe distance and then there's also, you know, the opening and the combination of the two kind of dictates what you can, can and can't do. Uh, shields are good when there's going to be flying objects, but you want it to be clear if you still need to see it. Subpart. Okay, so these are the regulations. Now, I took out the hand and power tool, so forget about that. But um, subpart out ANSI B11 and there's B11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and maybe 5 that all revolves around machine guarding or machine safeguarding, the way they say it. NFPA 70, 79 is uh, proper electrical design for industrial equipment. So here's some real basic stuff. Here's a breakdown of the standards, if you needed to look something up. They go over some general things. One or more types of guard need to be used. Barrier, two-hand uh, trip, uh, two-hand actuator is what we call it. Electronic safety devices, which would be like an, uh, a, a light curtain or something like that or something that's affixed to the machine where possible, point of operation guarding. A lot of um, companies we can actually fa furnish f fashion, furnish fashion the stuff in-house. And there's some even cooler new uh, materials for guarding. It doesn't have to be the heavy duty wire mesh anymore. Um, there's something called, I think it's called orange skin. Is that what a student told me? That it can be form fitted to what you need and it meets the basic requirements. Uh, for machine guarding. 
<laughs> Something as simple as a fan floor fan. Uh, the blades, the opening of the blades can be no more than a half inch. And that's a good rule of thumb to go by is, you know, can, could a finger fit through half an inch? And if so, how far away does it need to be from the blades or the point of operation? <sighs> Almost all equipment needs to be uh, fixed to the floor or anchored to the floor because if you're using it and it wobbles around, you now have a chance to contact the machine. It's like a, it's, it's a way to make sure that the guarding's in place is correct or operates properly. It's really easy to sight abrasive wheels because there are two types of guards. Now, the, the shield you see above, we really don't, aren't concerned about that. We'd rather have them wear face shields for that. But the basic, there's basic idea is you have the tool rest, you have the tongue guard, and then you have to make sure you use the ring test when you replace the stone because you want to make sure it's not fractured. These things are rotating at like 2,000 plus rotations per minute. So if they were to fracture and break, you'd have stone accelerating out at a very high speed and it can actually penetrate um, a person's torso or face. Work rest needs to be adjusted to one eighth inch, tongue guard one quarter inch. Also, if you have a light fix there that has a, um, a what do they call those? A, a regular light bulb that has to be guarded as well to prevent it from shattering and then creating a uh, electrical hazard. And sure, yeah, it needs to be mounted just like everything else. Oh yeah, check the spindle against maximum speed. So the, the stones are set up for certain speeds. You don't want to put on something too fast because there could be a, a vibration that causes it to break. And then you do the ring test. You just, you dangle it from like something and then you tap it really light and it should ring if it is all completely intact. If it has some sort of fracture or crack in it and you tap it, it'll just thud and then you're not supposed to use it. As far as training is involved, I mean, a guard still is part of training. It's not that you haven't eliminated the hazard. It could still be there. Could they still get into it? So you, you get to train the workers on the hazards associated with the particular machines, uh, what safeguards are there, how, what's intended to be used, um, why and how to use it, how to maybe detect and maybe kind of just like do like a safe test to make sure it's working, um, how, when they can be removed, by whom, and what to the safeguard? What to do if you find that it's damaged or doesn't seem to be working properly? So I caught through a lot of stuff there. 17 minutes, not bad. Pretty proud of myself for that. So there's a few more things I want to show you. I want to show you first what I have here. So I've got a link to the Rockford Systems page. I got a link to uh, uh, their document. It's, I think it's almost like 40 or 41 pages, but it's awesome. It uh, it was the actual slide deck that. Rockford system use when they come in and do this guest lecture. Uh, so it has a lot of information. And I, I want you to take a look at it. Here's the thing. Look and see what OUTA means. O-U-T-A. That's sort of their basic premise for proper guarding. So go ahead and look that up. Talk about it in this weekly assignment. OUTA. O-U-T-A. What do they stand for and how do, how do Rockford systems apply it? Uh, let's see. I think what I'll do is I think I'll move the OSHA thing here. Hopefully somebody gets that. It's never for me. Uh, so their OSHA's... Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, my daughter finally picked it up. So the machine guarding for OSHA. Uh, they've got the standards, hazard recognition, solutions, additional resources. So this is good stuff. So please just take a quick look at this. I think I also have this uh, publication 3170 available. If not, I will make it available. Here is the link to the homepage for Rockford Systems. Go here. This is the best stuff. I'm so glad that they, you know, it's a few hours away from campus, but they, they usually send people up to do a guest lecture. And I think they're starting to go more virtual. They do classes and it costs like 500 bucks to go to these classes, but um, they're the best. They're very good. I also have a, they have a YouTube for basic machine safety or safeguarding. It's, a, it's an hour long, but if you're gonna be getting into this stuff, watch it, it's good stuff. I refer to them. And then he actually, the guy who came and spoke actually has uh, case studies that you could look at. I may actually use these next week when we do our uh, next uh, meeting if you wanna get ahead on that. So it looks like I haven't put the OSHA thing on here yet, but I will. Uh, I think, oh, okay. So here's the stuff from Rockford Systems, the machine safeguarding seminar. Um, this is the one that people pay you know, hundreds of dollars to. I've got all the basic slides. This is where I want you to look up and see what OUTA is. 
And they get into the ANSI B11 standard really well. I mean, this is amazing stuff. And he has to go through it so fast. Here they're talking about lockout takeout. Machine guarding lockout takeout. There's a lot of crossover, a lot of things that are related there. Look, he's got the NFPA 70E. We had just talked about that in the last lecture. And here are the um, uh, case studies. So if I look back real quick, oh, we're just under 20 minutes or just over. That's not bad for me. That's everything I really want you to get away with um, safeguarding. Uh, it's pretty much if you see something moving on a machine where somebody could get their hand or get caught in it to, to it or nipped, you got to guard it. You got to prevent them from being able to get into it or put in a present sensing device so that it shuts down. Uh, should anybody get too close? Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to put braking mechanisms on these things. So if people do, you know, if, if their sense, if their presence is sensed either through a light curtain or they also have pre pressure sensitive um, flooring to see when somebody gets in. It should not only just cut the power, but it should break as well. Again, because there could be momentum um, or in the controls themselves, you know, two hand actuator or something that people actuate it, a gate closes before it cycles and does its work. There's all kinds of things you can do in Rockford systems, I think is state of the art when it comes to all this stuff.